This week on the CNET Tech Review, Facebook launches new features and ruffles some feathers. HTC thinks it's time for the plum-colored rhyme. A look back at Apple's biggest flops and a site that offers to manage your social life for you. It's all coming up right now. Hi everyone, I'm Molly Wood and welcome to the CNET Tech Review where we collect our hottest videos of the week and tell you what's good and what's bad in the world of tech. Plus we offer our own unique tech wisdom in the form of the bottom line. Let's start with the good. We'll get to my Facebook gripes in a bit here, but first, HTC's long-rumored Bliss handset made its debut in New York this week. And it's actually called the Rhyme and not the Bliss. We sent Bridget Carey, the newest member of the CNET TV family, to get the scoop on this decidedly female-friendly phone. Hi, I'm Bridget Carey with CNET TV, here with your first look at the HTC Rhyme. I'm at the launch event here in New York, and they didn't exactly say this was for women, but you kind of get that vibe because it comes in purple and has lots of accessories, like the one I'm holding right here. You might be wondering, what is this dangling thing? It's called the charm. So you plug it in, and you let it stick out of your purse, and it lights up when you have a missed call or someone's calling you or you have a text message. It also comes with a docking station that kind of reminds you of like an alarm clock. You can put it by your bed. And it also comes with headsets. Now, as you can see, the headsets are flat rubber, so it's supposed to not get tangled as easily because we all just hate when that happens. Sold separately are also some other matching accessories, like the plum-colored Bluetooth headset, or a, a speaker visor for your car, and also a workout armband. So the phone itself has a nice feminine feel. The specs inside aren't too bad. It comes with two cameras, one five megapixel in the back and another one in the front for video chatting. It's a 3.7 inch screen, a one gigahertz processor. It has four gigs of memory, internal eight gigs um, in a separate SD card. Now as far as the interface goes, you're going to notice there are slightly different tweaks in this HTC Sense, like the ability to just you know, quickly get a glance at your latest mail or messages without having to go all the way into the program. And the camera itself has a few other tweaks, like being able to take five shots at once in 2.5 seconds. So ladies, if having some accessories tickles your fancy, it's going to be available September 29th at Verizon for $1.99, and that includes the three accessories like the charm, the charging dock, and the matching earphones. For CNET TV, I'm Bridget Carey. Thanks, Bridget, and welcome aboard. And yes, let's just actually say that the rhyme is really aimed at women. Well, women and prince. Honestly, I hope HTC was nice enough to give him one for free. The new fall TV season is in full swing with a whole slew of new shows hitting the airwaves. One such show is the new CBS series Person of Interest, which imagines a world where no one is safe from the prying eyes of government surveillance. Kind of like Facebook. Brian Cooley visited the Person of Interest set to find out just how close the show might be to real life. The eyes that never sleep in streets on buildings at ATMs. 50 million video cameras silently rolling on our every move, capturing our location and when we were there. Four billion hours a week recorded typically and monitored live possibly, and all of it at the core of a new CBS drama. The CBS show Person of Interest revolves around this concept of a machine that can hear, see, and therefore know just about anything about any of us. Who's doing what with that information? That's part of the mystery. You have a decision to make. The machine gave you another number. The leads on our show are, are doing work that they're uncertain of. They feel ethically uncertain about and yet compelled to pursue it. Most of them are just ordinary people like her. A thousand, two thousand, five thousand different images simultaneously. This machine can see all at once. It's almost mm -hmm. like you know, dare I say, the big guy. Even if you think you can get through the day without being caught on video, your cell phone can sell you out. 83% of American adults now carry one. 35% a smartphone with advanced integration into their daily lives. The public wanted to be protected. They just didn't want to know how they were being protected. The government's been actively trying to build exactly the sort of databasing technology that we talk about 
in the pilot that we feature in, in the show for at least 10 years. So when they finally got a system that worked, they kept it secret. So while person of interest envisions a specific machine, in fact, we already live with one. The connectable dots of many forms of everyday surveillance that are perhaps even more powerful than what Finch and Reese work with. Really gives you something to think about, doesn't it? We'll have more from Cooley's visit to the set later in the show. If that piece has scared you into giving up your smartphone, it doesn't mean you have to stop taking photos and sharing them with your friends. Here's Josh Goldman with a new point-and-shoot camera from Samsung that has plenty of social networking features built right inside. Hey there, I'm Josh Goldman with CNET, and this is a look at the Samsung SH100. So it's probably no surprise that smartphones are killing some of the sales of lower-end point-and-shoots. Uh, with all the apps and instant uploading, there's just no way to compete with that. However, the sub-$200 SH100 is a solid attempt. For starters, it has built-in Wi-Fi that can be used for quickly connecting to a hotspot, uh, for wireless uploads to Facebook or sending off in an email. The Wi-Fi can also be used to back up photos to a PC or connect to smartphones for use as a remote viewfinder. All you have to do for that is just download an app available for Samsung Galaxy devices and the iPhone 4. Uh, support for other Android devices is in the works. Anyway, you just open the app and you can use it to connect the SH100 to your device and use it to control the camera. The camera is also loaded with photo and movie filters and some simple editing tools. And the 3 inch touchscreen on back makes using them pretty easy. Plus, you can drag and drop icons around just like you would on a smartphone. Now, photo quality isn't much better than you'd get from a smartphone, uh, particularly low light shots. But for sharing online, they look very good, and you do get a 26 millimeter wide angle lens with a 5x zoom, and you really don't get that with a phone. Uh, basically, with this camera, you get a lot of the same benefits of your smartphone's camera, but with a better lens, faster performance, and more comfortable shooting. I'm Josh Goldman, and that's the Samsung SH100. I do miss having an optical zoom on my camera phone, but I'm not sure I miss it enough to start carrying both a phone and a camera again. While we're on the topic of social networking, is anyone else feeling overwhelmed trying to manage all of your alert settings or missing posts that you should have seen? If so, Sharon Vaknin has yet another service to sign up for, but this one aims to help you manage all the rest. What if you could get a text message every time someone posts an apartment listing on Craigslist? Or maybe you'd like to automatically back up Facebook photos to your Dropbox. I'm Sharon Backen for CNET.com, here to show you how to use a web app called If This Then That, which lets you automate tasks for web services like Facebook, Dropbox, Twitter, Flickr, and more. If This Then That, or IFT as they like to call it, is based on the simple logic of its name. If this happens on one service, then do that on another service. Here's how it works. Head to ifttt.com, enter some new account information, and once you confirm your email address, you'll see the dashboard. To start things off, click Create a Task. On the next page, click this, and you'll see a couple dozen web services. More are being added, but if this then that, added the most popular ones first. Also, you'll need to activate most of the channels before you can use them, but only the first time around. So, as an example, today I'll make it so that whenever I favorite a tweet, the article from that tweet will be added to Instapaper, which is really useful for me since I get a lot of news from Twitter but can't always read it right away. To do that, first I'm going to select Twitter. If you haven't activated it yet, you'll need to do so now. So, now you're presented with many triggers. For this, I'll select New Favorite Tweet, then Create Trigger. To select an action channel, click that. I'm going to select Instapaper, then Read Later for the action. If this, then that fills the section out for you, so just click Create Action, give your task a name, and then click Create. Now, whenever I favorite a tweet, it'll be added to my Instapaper account. You can create hundreds of combinations for tasks, but if you go to the Recipes section, you'll see that many people have already created many useful ones for you. 
Just filter by service, and when you find the task you want, click the arrow, then create task to enable it. I personally like that this site uses text message actions, notifying you via SMS about anything from a new post on Craigslist to a brand new how-to blog on CNET.com. Play around with the tasks and recipes and let me know which useful ones you find by tweeting me or leaving a comment on my Facebook page. For CNET, I'm Sharon Vaknin, and I'll see you on the interwebs. Great! Now I can set it up to call my phone every time I get a new Gmail message. I'm sure that wouldn't be annoying at all. Information overload much? While you work out all of your trigger combos, I am going to take a break. But stick around, there's a lot more tech review coming up right after this. Welcome back to the CNET Tech Review, our weekly video digest of all things good and bad we've seen here at CNET TV. Continuing on in the good, let's check back in with Brian Cooley on the set of Person of Interest for some behind the scenes secrets and whether the machine might really exist. I'm Brian Cooley from CNET.com. We're on location in Prospect Park, Brooklyn, with Richard J. Lewis, the producing director of Person of Interest, the new CBS Fall series. Richard, as we're watching this take place, and people have to detect a certain, a certain discomfort between the characters, the technology that they're using, that's a key part of what the whole energy is in this show, isn't it? I think it is. I mean, I think there's a real kind of mystery around not only Reese and Finch, the two lead characters of the show, but the technology that is instituted to uncover or surveil all the people of New York City. A wireless camera, and you can keep an eye on them from anywhere. We call it the machine. And the machine can detect a violent yes, act is. that is about to happen to a victim or a perpetrator. Finch gets a social security number, and basically he knows which person, the person of interest, is going to be that person of the week. You have a decision to make. The machine gave you another number. Where is the machine? You know, it's funny. I asked, I asked Jonah Nolan where the machine was, and he said, I don't know, maybe in Fort Knox, maybe not. We don't know. That's part of the mystery. That's part of the, the idea around the show is that uh, there's, there's a lot of enigmatic stuff. We live in 1984. It's just like, you know, 28 years it later. It just came a little late. We're all being looked at. We're all being listened to. Hi, Every transaction we make, every time we get on the subway, when we use the Easy Pass to go over a bridge, mm -hmm. we're being tracked. We're being tracked globally by satellites. We're being tracked all over the map. In Lower Manhattan, there's at least 4,000 surveillance cameras. They can see 360. They can actually rotate on axis. They can pan. They can tilt. And they can think. Techniques of facial recognition, looking at iris, looking at stride. The other way they think is basically by dis discerning what an object is. And the computer is programmed to understand certain shapes and it becomes pretty interesting. It becomes a little unnerving. Let's use the real. <laughs> the I real think it's a very scary right. part of where we, I, I have to agree with you. It's provocative material. It's scary. It's stuff, and it's stuff that's happening to us right now. And then you hack into their cell phone. In fact, it's interesting to note that even if our cell phone is off, the authorities can tap into the microphone in the cell phone and hear a conversation in the vicinity. That's one of, of the most eerie things you see mm -hmm. in this show mm -hmm. is how the cell phone becomes this eavesdropping device without really any apparent effort. This is not some server room. This is not some sterile technology environment. We're here in the normal real world, a street in New York. It's where, where they're sending that information, because mm -hmm. they're sending that information to a, a bank of servers that go on forever and ever. It's like a huge kind of eye, like a giant insect eye, in which you see 1,000, 2,000, 5,000 different images simultaneously. This machine can see all at once. You know, it's almost mm -hmm. like, you know, dare I say, the big guy. Action. Now we're watching your monitor here, Richard, and things look like film, but I know you're not shooting with film cameras. We're using an Aerial Alexa, which has a, a, a very interesting film grain look. We're able to kind of color time and, and, and get proper exposure and looks, various looks. And you're doing that, it sounds like, in real time, where most of us the hacks, fly. we would do that in post and some Final Cut thing. On the fly. Yeah. Right now, what's really interesting about using digital, the digital medium is being able to control it on the spot. And that's what we're doing. And we, we have a, a number of different types of cameras that we use. As you know, the world has all these different surveillance cameras. We have our own. Set yeah, this of is your big camera. This is yeah. the pro camera. This but you're using we... a bunch of basically surveillance cameras well, for a show about surveillance. Right. We want to separate the two looks. We want to make sure that people know when it's surveillance. And we downgrade that image and we, we mess with it and screw with it. This is our HD POV. 
and it is a fantastic camera. See this lens right here? It's a, essentially an equivalent to about an eight millimeter fisheye lens. Really wide. Really wide. Sometimes I'll take it and I'll put it in the corner of an elevator, or we'll put it on an ATM machine, or we'll put it, you know, in a phone booth. It's a really important tool that we use all the time. I found him, but somebody else found him first. You're blending looks in a production today that I don't think was necessarily the case in most productions up until fairly recently, because there wasn't an array of video looks or languages, was there? No, I mean, I, I think filmmakers like Oliver Stone, Martin Scorsese, in the past, they have blended these looks. Tony Scott, you know, they have used Super 8 footage, used video footage, used 16 and 35, and I think now that language is coming into television, and, you know, we're hoping to be sort of uh, new in doing that. We've been talking to Richard J. Lewis, producing director of Person of Interest, new CBS series that airs 9 p.m. Eastern on Thursday nights, 8 o'clock Central. I'm Brian Cooley from CNET.com. I hope Michael Emerson really is one of the good guys this time, but we've fallen for that one before, haven't we? All right, now let's see what we can find in the bad. In light of recent success stories like the iPhone, the iPad, even the Mac itself, it's easy to forget that Apple has also had its share of failures over the years. So for all you Apple haters out there, feel free to gloat as Cooley counts down this week's top five. Apple's had so many hits the last 15 years or so, it really seems cheap and small and petty to run down their duds. But boy, is it fun. I'm Brian Cooley with top five Apple flops. Ranking these is real subjective, so I went the way you would. Let's rank them by how much you can get for them on eBay. Here we go. The number five Apple flop is the Newton OS message pads. Now, this is going to raise hackles since descendants, iPhone and iPad, are now Apple's biggest business. But Apple made like six models of the message pad, and Motorola made some, and Sharp took a whack at them, and nobody could get it right. It was just this slow motion disaster. I recall when these were new, and they were scorned everywhere. And didn't they have Newton stores, too? What a mess. Price-wise, these don't fetch a lot. 30 to 50 bucks for one on eBay. Number four, the Mac G4 Cube. We'd never seen a computer like this, and its short time in production keeps it that way. This silent, fanless monolith with a toaster slot on top for CDs was real different. But thanks to that odd shape, you couldn't really put any expansion cards in it back at a time when you actually cared about such things. And it was pricey, about 200 bucks more than a conventionally shaped Mac that had similar performance. Oh, and the cases often cracked, which is really annoying on a machine you pay top dollar for, for its looks. They made about 150,000 of these, so they aren't real hard to find on eBay, and they seem to fetch about 100 or 200 bucks. Number three was the Pippin. Remember this one? It was produced with Bandai of Japan, rolled out around 96, as a game console with a light version of System 7 on it as its OS. It was gutless, there was damn near nothing to run on it in terms of titles, and the price was like 600 bucks, about 850 in today's dollars. 42,000 or so were made, eBay prices top out around 400 bucks or so for a really clean unit. Number two is the 20th anniversary Mac. It was one of the first things Steve Jobs killed when he came back to the company, and I suspect he did it standing inside a pentagram, because this thing is so not him. Like all crap labeled executive, it's full of form over function. For $7,500, over $10,000 in today's money, you'd get an all-in-one design, okay, kind of cool, with a small 12-inch display, and beyond that, not much interesting. Oh, there was a Joey pouch disc tray in front, and buttons on the front panel arranged for looks instead of works. The whole thing came off like Sharper Image had a one-night stand with Bang & Olufsen. And the 20th anniversary Mac was star-crossed from the beginning. It launched in 1997, Apple's 21st year. That said, you seem to be able to get about 700 bucks for a good complete one on eBay. Before I take you to the number one Apple flop, ranked by eBay price, let's consider one so awful and so unimportant, it doesn't even deserve a true spot on the list. That damn round USB puck mouse from the original iMac. Totally round, so you never knew which way to point it. Size, so only a raccoon could articulate it. 
and just ugly with that bad late 90s semi-translucent plastic with Jolly Rancher color accents. This thing was a mess. I found a basket of 20 of them on eBay for 35 bucks. Overpriced. My number one Apple flop, Macintosh TV. I'd actually forgotten about this. This was the first black Mac. It was basically a Mac Performa that had a Sony Trinitron television bolted to it and a cable tuner inside. You could use it as a computer or switch to watching TV, but you couldn't watch TV in a window or anything cool like that. It made a mockery of the word integration. About 10,000 were made, so there's a handful of them sticking up eBay any given day at around $800. Now, for the brighter side of life, don't miss my other companion video to this, Top 5 Steve Jobs' Greatest Hits. That's also available at top5.cnet.com. I'm Brian Cooley. Thanks for watching. To steal a phrase from Brian Tong, those are truly some bad apples. Although there is something about that little Macintosh TV. It's a little clunky, but that black case is pretty slick. All right, with that, let's move right along to this week's bottom line. Facebook rolled out yet another redesign this week, and just like clockwork, the masses immediately took to the site to complain about the changes. And that was even before the F8 conference held yesterday, where even bigger changes were announced. Take a look at what the future holds in store for Facebook. Hi, Rafe Needleman from CNET here at the Facebook F8 Developers Conference, where a very polished Mark Zuckerberg just announced some important new changes in the way people share information and connect with friends. We've been working on it all year, and we're calling it Timeline. This is very, very exciting for every entrepreneur who's trying to build an audience and build a personalized web experience for their audience using the Facebook products. First, there's a new view of what you're doing and what you've done on Facebook called the timeline. Now with this, everything you do from taking photos to cooking shows up in one place in chronological order. Information is summarized automatically as you go further back in time and users can customize most aspects of the timeline to show friends how they want to appear. Whether it's you're endorsing a friend, posting a job, maybe you just changed jobs or maybe you just got a promotion things that are important to you professionally that should go into this new timeline in Facebook. Now this is a developers conference and this news is big for Facebook developers. Now they'll be able to get data into the timeline automatically and without spamming users profile pages every time someone say goes for a run or listens to a track of music. He has this nice running app that he's using to keep track of his runs and I think that's pretty cool. So I'm just going to hover over it and click add to timeline and I'm going to get this nice pop-up and I can just click on it add to my timeline it's right on my timeline. Most of these activities will appear in the new Facebook ticker, the live view of what people are doing in real time on Facebook. Six of my friends are watching an episode of Glee on Hulu. And I can just hover over that and click and watch it in a new social Canvas app that Hulu has built. And that's another key point for users and especially for media services like Spotify and iHeartRadio and video sites like Netflix. We think the radio listening experience is inherently social that people love to talk to their friends about stuff. They like to go places. In the old days, it was the request line. It was the song dedications. Now they're able to do that virtually by using Facebook. Your friends can see what you're doing immediately and pop up their own windows to show the same show and watch it with you. You have complete control over your timeline, what you show there, how you display it, and who can see it. To share the media that you're viewing on Facebook with your friends in real time is rolling out today. The timeline view is rolling out in beta today and to the general population in a few months. It's the story of your life. You have all your stories, all your apps, and a new way to express who you are. For CNET, I'm Rafe Needleman. The bottom line this week, Facebook is your entire life. They've now collected everything you've ever done and made it easier to collect everything you ever will do everywhere you go. Wow. Hey, but maybe seeing it all collected like that will freak us out and make us share less. Yeah, not likely. All right, that's it for this time, everyone, but come back next week for an all-new CNET Tech Review. Until then, there are tons of great videos available every day at CNETTV.com. See you next time, and thank you for watching.